Um, when Alan came uh, to the United States several years ago, uh, we've had a pretty long-standing relationship. I used to hassle him about how he always had ketchup stains on his t-shirts. And uh, you can tell he's, he's spiffing it up quite a bit. Stu was actually saying he, uh, with the cross around his neck now, with the nice scarf action, he actually uh, looks a little bit like the Pope of Missional. <laughs> so I think we need to start calling him that. Uh, we brought Alan into Denver Seminary for a, kind of a national conference a couple of years ago. And uh, as he was talking, a couple of pastors sort of leaned over and one of them said, when Alan talks, it's sort of like uh, you know he's kicking you sort of between the, the ears. Uh, he's killing you, but with that nice Australian accent, it just, it just makes you kind of want to love him and receive it. There's uh, a prophetic voice that he's brought to this conversation. But what's unique about uh, what Alan, I think, has helped all of us in is that he brings a posture uh, that allows somebody to actually want to hear that. Um, last night when we were driving out of here, uh, some of the guys in the car, we were talking about how hard it's been over the years to actually have the missional conversation without starting a fight. And uh, how for the first time it seems as though everybody's calming down and settling into this idea of there has to be a change. And it, we were realizing it wasn't about that there's like this new truth that all of a sudden has dropped in. People have been talking uh, this missional ideology and ethos for decades. What has changed is the posture. The posture of, of those in the mega world and the posture of those in the micro, instead of fighting anymore, uh, there's a sense of humility and a sense of listening to each other. I want to talk to you briefly about the power of our posture. Posture actually means the attitude of the body. Okay, you can, you can view it as the attitude of the body of the church, or it's just uh, sociologically, it's the attitude of your body. It's um, the perception or the look on your face. Um, it's how you touch people with your hands. It's the inflection of your voice. Um, it's essentially what's called our nonverbals. And when we learn about our nonverbal forms of communication, is they're the very most important forms of communication, way beyond just our words. So uh, in, in my marriage with Cheryl, uh, it's been absolutely incredible the entire time. There's been just a few moments, though, where there's been maybe a little conflict. And uh, one, of, one of the times, I remember, we're, we're in a little bit of a snit, and uh, Cheryl makes a comment. She goes, would you quit rolling your eyes at me? And I said, look, you know, don't worry about my eyes. They just kind of, they roll, you know? <laughs> So don't, it's, don't worry about that, okay? Because uh, I'm, I'm still with you right here. The ears are here, babe, so just let the eyes do what, whatever, okay? Don't worry. How do you think that went over? <laughs> Not so good. So, honey, how you doing? Fine. Well, cool. I just wanted to make sure you're good. <laughs> how did that go over? Not so good. It's the attitude of our body, how we communicate non-verbally, far more important than what we do with our words. When we've been talking about missional community, uh, here's one of the concerns I have, is missional is that, is that sending impulse. It's a part of God that just goes, look, you gotta get out of uh, the church. It's what he said to Abraham, you gotta leave your mom and dad's house and you're gonna have to go and you're gonna have to, I'm gonna bless you and you're gonna bless the whole world, but you gotta go. That's the, that's the missional sending impulse. The incarnational is essentially the posture, and the posture is going to be more important. Here's what's hap what, what happens or what it might look like if you go out missionally without being incarnational. Can we cue the picture? <laughs> Let me ask you some questions, okay? I, so I don't know where I got this, but man, I, hang, I hung on to it. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is this guy fervent? You agree? Fervent? Is he committed? Is he, is he bold? Is he willing to engage his culture? Does he believe in truth? He's got... Probably. He's, okay. Actually, it looks similar to the cross Alan was wearing around his neck, doesn't it? Is this a guy, though, that you, if you go out with your friends, you've been a sent community, and you go out with your friends to the world, uh, is this a guy that you want necessarily in the room when you actually are with your friends that you, you think are moving towards a belief or a faith or a trust in your community? Do you want this guy showing up to your small group? 
No, you don't. That's the, that's the question of incarnation. Right now, I'd suggest that we have a posture issue in, in our culture. Uh, we don't necessarily have a lack of getting truth out. Somehow, our nonverbals maybe need a little bit of work. Uh, there's an article or a report coming out. Um, I think it came out yesterday. One of the most prominent pastors in the country lives in Dallas is being exposed for excess. Okay, We don't know if it's true or not, but the perception will be there's another Christian leader that has... Uh, lived in excess. It's a posture problem. I remember uh, being on the couch a few weeks ago, and I was sort of waking up watching some late night TV, and uh, there was one of our local late night hosts making fun of Pat Robertson's comments regarding uh, God's judgment upon Haiti because of a pact made with the devil. And I remember getting so angry just going, there's just another one. And then all of a sudden I just realized how often I have done things non-verbally uh, even as an evangelist that have made people just go, look, not interested. And I think all of us, if we're honest, we go, we're all a, sort of a part of this collective problem that the world is disoriented because of our posture. They're not disoriented because of our words. They go, look, I, we would love to try to figure out the God thing, but your rhetoric doesn't line up with the reality of what we see in our lives. That's an issue of the incarnation. And, and why Jesus, interestingly, at his time, the Greco-Roman world was very interested in God. They believed God was kind of an impersonal cosmic force, a word, out the logos, out there somewhere. But when you're not quite sure exactly what this impersonal force is, you will oftentimes live as if there is no God at all. The Jewish people had not heard from God for 300 years. So they just go back to what was natural for them. They went back to legalistic religion. And so the world in which Jesus began to jump into, incarnate into, he knew it was disoriented spiritual God seekers. Everybody's trying to figure out who God is, but when you have all these, man, I think it's this, but oh, can you believe that? It's, I don't want to do that. There's a disorientation, and that's why the word went, we've got to leave heaven. The word became flesh and incarnated, and he dwelt among us so that we could what? Perceive his, his glory. We could understand. He jumped into humanity because he went, unless I jump into this, this thing, this malaise of confusion, they're never going to really know the real story. On the other side of the Pat Robertson story is a young man that's been leading worship, Aaron Ivey. And I just have heard the story through a friend, Brandon Hatmaker, of Aaron going to adopt a young man in Haiti. That's the difference. Incarnation causes you to go in. Interestingly, Jesus, with those that were demon-possessed, did he stand far off and say, well, you're kind of getting what you deserve? No, what does Jesus do with those that are possessed by demons? He takes care of their demons, does he not? That's the incarnation. The Word became flesh. There's a story I want to read to you. Uh, it's, I think, one of the most uh, important incarnational stories that we have. It's a woman caught in adultery, clearly a sinner, okay? It's not somebody that was faking sin or that they brought out. This is a story of a woman that is caught in sin. It says, now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The, the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that uh, such should be stoned. By what do you say? And Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger. And though he did not hear, as though he did not hear. And so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said among them, he who is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. This is an interesting story. Stoning, obviously, probably would have been um, not only humiliating, but extremely terrifying. So you've got to somehow go into this moment. Imagine that's you, okay? And stoning, you know, people are going to start picking up, they're going to pick up little stones because everybody want, wants to get in on it. And, uh, but other people are going to pick up some big stones because they don't want it to last that long. But eventually, it's not just you get pelted for six hours. Everybody throws in, but then somebody's going to grab a big rock, and they're just going to smash it on your skull. So she knows that's coming. So imagine this probably 25-year-old woman. She, by nature, would have been stooping down, and she probably would have been covering her head. If it's me, I'm probably gasping for air. I can't breathe. I'm so afraid says that Jesus stoops down the first time. As if he doesn't hear him, they're talking. Jesus judges woman. He just 
we ex try to exegete what in the heck he's like he's writing their names. I don't know if we should be trying to worry about what he's writing in the sand. He's probably stooping down because he's next to this woman. And he wants her to know that he's there. He wants her to feel maybe his leg against her. Maybe he put his arm around her. He's kind of writing, but uh, she's heaving for oxygen. And he's there. And then they keep pestering him, so he stands up. And he says, you who have not sinned, go ahead, start chucking the rocks. Then he stoops back down. Can you imagine a little bit of hope that begins to rise up in this woman? Like, maybe this isn't going to happen today. And then... They all clear out. There's this moment of silence. They've all left, and he says to the woman, where are all of your accusers? And she said, they're gone. He says, neither do I accuse you. Incarnation is to be an advocate for lost people. It's to stoop down, protect them, to consider them disoriented, just like you were. Somebody asked me the other day in the session, if, if we really hang out deeply with people, aren't we condoning their behavior? If I really make a friend of a homosexual, aren't I condoning their behavior? And if you take that line of thinking to its extreme, we would all be in a, a world of hurt, would we not? Scripture seemed to indicate that while we were yet sinners, Christ came, jumped into humanity, stooped down next to us, protected us. Let us know I'm right here. Removed condemnation because he died for it. You don't have to try to worry about people's sin because Jesus said that he managed it once and for all in Hebrews. If he took care of sin, you don't have to worry about it as much. You don't have to worry about it in other people's lives. It's not the issue. What you'll notice is when that entire situation is over, he looks at the woman and he says, he drops some truth on her, right? He says, woman, you don't have to sin anymore. This is the power of incarnation. Truth, proclamation, uh, the reality of our sin and the need for a savior and you need to get your act together. That's all part of truth. But incarnation, what it does is that it wins the heart. When you advocate for lost people, when you stoop down, you've actually won their heart. And then anything you say of truth will make sense. May God explode your heart and thrust you out into the world, but may he uh, bring his sense of um, love. May you have a sense um, of how much God has stooped down for you. May you not worry about condoning behavior, but simply winning the heart of the world. Missional and incarnational community. That's what the world needs right now.